Um, it is my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Barry Markovsky. He is a sociology professor here at USC, and uh, in addition to many other things, is the advisor for the Pastafarians, which is probably what puts him uh, most dearly into my heart. Um, and uh, since we are getting started a little bit late, I will leave his introduction at that, and please join me in welcoming Barry Markovsky. <laughs> I think I'll actually carry this. All right. Well, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me here to this wonderful conference. Uh, this presentation format's a little different for me. Um, I noticed uh, on the YouTube um, TED talk that Richard Dawkins gave that he was working from notes. He was actually reading his notes. And I haven't done that in probably 20 years. Um, but I'm going to do it today just because uh, I want to make sure I stay within the time. And I'm kind of pushing myself into some areas I don't usually talk about. Uh, so a lot of this material is, is kind of a little bit unfamiliar to me, actually. Uh, I should say up front that the uh, description of my presentation and the handout that you all got was a starting point, and I'm actually, what I'm actually presenting has evolved quite a bit, and um, so it's a direct descendant from that starting point, but now it looks very different. This is a, uh, an alternative title uh, suggested by my wife, actually, and um, Rose and I are far from perfect when it comes to uh, applying critical thinking skills, but we've acknowledged that we have a problem, and uh, we're, we're in a 12-step program to try to, uh, try to solve our critical thinking deficit. Um, but it's, it's an ongoing thing, and we're, we're working on it, as we all should be. Beliefs affect our orientations and behaviors in important spheres, such as politics and religion and personal relationships. And today I'm going to scratch the surface of what we know about beliefs, their sources, their nature, and their consequences. You'll see that this and the next six slides uh, each include a quote about beliefs that may or may not be relevant to each point. But I think these are very wise sayings, so please feel free to attend to them and ignore me completely. Uh, first one by John Stewart, religion. It's given people hope in a world torn apart by religion. So beliefs are expectations that certain objects exist and have certain properties or that certain events will occur under certain conditions and so on. They connect a property to something else. I believe that grass is green. I believe that the apocalypse is nigh. Share uh, believes in life after love. <laughs> and a uh, quote from W.C. Fields, a man's got to believe in something. I believe I'll have another drink. Beliefs are a part of systems. Most of our beliefs are embedded in systems that include not just our beliefs, but also attitudes, memories, goals, judgments, and other cognitive elements our beliefs are also contingent on the beliefs expressed by certain others around us. And they're a major factor in how we choose to behave. Belief systems have complex web-like structures with some elements more centralized and well-connected and other elements more peripheral. Consider how when certain beliefs are contradicted, it's easy to say, I stand corrected. These are usually peripheral beliefs. Changing them is easy because little else rides on them. I might believe that uh, chocolate ice cream is the most popular. Then I learn that surveys show it's actually vanilla ice cream and by a wide margin, which is actually true. Uh, well, I can believe that. I stand corrected. This doesn't affect my preferences or really anything else that I believe to be true about the world. Other beliefs are more embedded or central within our belief systems. If you believe God is the Lord and creator of the universe, then it's highly likely that you believe a host of other things that are closely associated with that belief. You may believe that you'll be reunited with loved ones in heaven or that everyone you love and everyone you like is given to you by God or that your prayers can make 
it more likely that somebody who is um, ill will be healed by the, by the grace of God. With such a big chunk of your way of conceptualizing reality hinging on this central belief, it's not likely that you're going to change that belief very readily, even if you're confronted with evidence that would seem to point to the contrary. Uh, millenarian groups are a great example. The author of one famous study embedded himself in a group that believed the world would be ending at a particular time and date, and the group members built their reality around this belief, giving away uh, all of their earthly goods and saying goodbye to loved ones who weren't joining them. And when the world didn't end, their beliefs were not affected one iota. Instead, they adopted an additional belief that through the power of their faith, the world was saved. Carl Sagan, it's far better to grasp the universe as it really is and to persist in delusion, however satisfying and reassuring. Beliefs have causes. One aspect of a scientific approach to beliefs is to understand where they come from. And we could spend a whole semester on the many possible causes and sources of beliefs, and later I'm going to run through just a few of them quickly. And here the quote is from Richard Dawkins, Sources of Beliefs. It's a telling fact that the world over, the vast majority of children follow the religion of their parents rather than any of the other available religions. Beliefs have effects. Similarly, we could devote a whole semester to studying the consequences of having adopted certain kinds of beliefs. And again, I'm just going to run through a uh, very few of these um, in a moment. A quote from JFK, similar to one of the others, belief in myths allows the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. By Good beliefs, I mean those which have a basis in what is true and not solely on what we wish to be true. I think that the desire for our beliefs to be good in this sense is actually universal. And uh, had to include something from George Carlin. Frisbeterianism is a belief that when you die, your soul goes up on the roof and gets stuck. <laughs> Bad beliefs are those which are false. And very bad beliefs are false beliefs that cause some kind of harm. It's probably safe to say that all wars have conflicts of beliefs at their core. And another stand-up comic. Come on. Richard Jenny, you're basically killing each other to see who's got the better imaginary friend. So very briefly, some causes. Uh, the diagram just illustrates eight of the many possible sources of beliefs filtered through various media and social influences, starting from the top and going clockwise, interpersonal sources such as one-on-one -on -one conversations or messaging, emails, and so on. Internet sources such as news sites, blogs, interest groups, uh, books and periodicals, families, uh, siblings, grandparents, other relatives, parents especially are influential in our beliefs, authorities, educators, clergy, political leaders, groups of all sorts, uh, peer groups, friendship circles, down at the bottom, television, videos, movies, and in the background the shadowy figures represent culture. Uh, cultures influence our beliefs and values, usually without our even being aware of it, until we see that different cultures have different sets of beliefs and values. On the effects side, the consequences of beliefs, going again from the top, uh, just, a, just a few selected ones. Beliefs about others affect whom we love. In a democracy, beliefs affect whom we elect as public officials. Beliefs affect decisions about religious orientations. Beliefs affect our likes and our dislikes, our attitudes and values. Our beliefs affect the beliefs of others, especially those to whom we are socially close. 
Beliefs affect our judgments and decision making in all spheres of activity. And lastly, our beliefs, when aggregated, have the potential to alter groups through trends, social movements, collective actions, and so on. Emotions play a huge role in our beliefs. All of us use emotions to make judgments that lead to beliefs. Lacking full information or when conditions are too complex to understand fully, we may have little choice but to go with our gut feelings. There are some problems with this approach, however. There's irrefutable evidence that emotions turn up the distortion knob on our judgments. This leaves us vulnerable to all manner of misjudgments, false beliefs, and ultimately manipulation by others. Another problem is that we become emotionally attached to certain beliefs and attitudes. Neglecting to drop a false belief because we like it is every bit as bad as adopting a false belief from the outset. Beliefs can make us feel good, feel part of something bigger, feel connected to others, and so sometimes we hate to see them go. Um, I'm going to show you uh, a short TV ad. It's, in, in this case, an advertiser is taking us through the emotional gamut. And you'll see tremendous pain in the faces of a mother and daughter, and how sad it is to see their lives torn apart for whatever the reason. And then the comic relief comes in, and it's brilliant humor, and a very prominent display of the product that's timed to coincide with our emotional responses. So it's very manipulative, but also very effective and, and kind of fun. commercial. Uh, <laughs> think about um, revival meetings where the pitch and cadence of the preacher's voice coordinated with a choir and with musicians goes through waves of building up and then reaches a crescendo and then brings you back down and then repeats that build up crescendo descent and it takes crowds on an emotional roller coaster. And then you associate a message with those feelings. And it kind of locks in that message. It becomes real in a way that a simple rational discussion uh, could never achieve. So it's hard to get around the impact of emotions. But if, for a particular belief, it's more important for you to be right than it is for you to feel right, you can learn to check emotions at the door. And I'm not advocating becoming unemotional. It's just there are certain places where emotions are less appropriate than others. I'm going to switch now to the group level. Uh, I assumed that most of the audience members to, to whom I'd be making this presentation would consider themselves to be activists, actively engaged in efforts to make things happen in the world, to change minds, to change lives. Activists are optimists, and optimism is motivating. In most cases, however, the reality is that people will believe what they want to believe and not what you want them to believe. This can lead to discouragement when your efforts seem to have only a minor effect. And discouragement can flip optimism to pessimism. I think a dose of reality and a little perspective can be very useful here. As a sociologist, I like thinking about the large scale or macro implications of smaller scale or micro processes such as belief formation and change. One way to do this is to conceptualize the profile of a group's beliefs. This diagram shows one possibility for how beliefs may be distributed across a group or population. There's a segment of this group on the right side, maybe 25%, that is strongly with us, whatever that happens to mean. Another segment, maybe another 25% or so, that is toward us. They're moderately toward us. They're, we'll call them moderates. But on the other side of that midpoint is another 25% of moderates who are against us. 
And then at the far left of the diagram, about another 25% that is strongly against us. A reasonable goal in making a case for your position is to assume that those who are already with us will at worst stay about where they are or maybe move slightly further toward the right side of that scale. And this is preaching to the converted, essentially, an activity that isn't necessarily as worthless as the expression uh, implies. Among those who are strongly against us, you're not likely to change any minds there. The expression for this is talking to a wall. <laughs> Realistically, in most situations, most of the moderates on both sides of the divide are also likely to stay put. Worse, there's evidence that hearing your argument will actually help to inoculate some of those who are against you with better counter arguments and strengthen their positions on the other side. Still, among the moderates to, who are against us, there's likely to be a sliver of the population who are essentially uh, potential fence hoppers. This is where the action is. This is where you can bring to bear everything that you know about persuasion and social influence. In this case, maybe 10% of the population that's close enough to that fence that your words could move them over. There's no reason to assume that typical beliefs are distributed across populations in the form of a bell curve. At any given time, the shape of the population uh, or the shape of the distribution, distribution of beliefs could look like this. This is a somewhat polarized belief. In the previous graph, there was about an equal proportion of those who are with us strongly, those who are with us moderately, etc. Here, that proportion changes. Now the ones who are moderate are outnumbered two to one. With there being a lot more strongly supportive people, though, but if your goal is to try to influence people, to try to bring them over to your side, there are far fewer here to work with. The ramification is pretty uh, of this is pretty stunning. Now, the proportion of moderates who are potential fence hoppers has plummeted by around 50%. The lost fence hoppers, here you see outlined in dashed lines, to relate this to something in the real world, think about uh, political advertising aimed at the 25 or 30% of the electorate that's undecided between two candidates. Uh, they usually end up splitting proportionately between uh, the two sides, but not quite. And it's those ones that are just on the cusp that all the advertisements are really um, aim toward. So there are ramifications here for the activist. Let's assume you approach the situation as a realist and that you know something about the distribution of beliefs in the population. Then you shouldn't be discouraged if when your efforts to persuade have only uh, flipped 5% of the target population. Um, don't let that discourage you. If you ignore the macro structure of beliefs, though, you're bound to feel terribly discouraged by that. Um, or disappointed in yourself or others, um, it's better to be honest with what's really going on, and it's better to be informed about what's, what's really going on with the, with the group. And here's a truly depressing uh, situation. The two sides are so polarized, so entrenched, that the proportion of moderates has shrunk to maybe 20%, and there's almost nobody sitting near that fence that's likely to be uh, influenced by you. So you have to wonder here, is it even worth the effort? It takes me to the punchline. Yes, uh, I think it's worth the effort because everything I just said may be wrong. <laughs> Our assumptions about the distributions of beliefs may be wrong. People may be piled up, for all you know, on just the other side of that cusp waiting for a rational nudge to move them over to the other side, to your side. And I've also ignored the impact of social contagion processes. Influence doesn't occur in a vacuum. You influence one person from the other side, then they may influence other people on the other side. And you never know when a small amount of persuasion will ripple through a population, creating a kind of tipping point. Uh, so you have to keep trying, basically. Critical in all this is my one piece of advice. Don't let your convictions cloud your own judgment 
or ever make you stop examining your own beliefs dispassionately. Doing so is your best hope of actually being closer to the truth than those who reside on the other side of the distribution. And I'll close with one more quote. Uh, simply, this, this sums up why beliefs are so important and why it's so important that our beliefs be good ones. And that's my talk. Thank you. Oh, look.